Turn if you would to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Now I'm going to talk about three names that aren't popular, but they're the first three judges in Israel. And uh, a lot of people, you know, we know Samson is one of the most famous judges. Uh, Gideon was another famous one. But the first three were actually the best judges in Israel. And uh, they're the least spoken of. You know, if I would have said, oh, who's Othniel? Most of us, you know, might have been like, I remember reading about that, but I'm not really sure. Or if I said, who's Ehud? You would be like, I might have known that name, but I'm not really sure. Shamgar, one of my personal favorites. Because uh, just that's the sound stuff. Shamgar. You say it out loud three times, it's a manly man. But these three judges, we're going to talk about them a little bit. And uh, pray to be a blessing to you this message as we learn about these judges and how it applies to us today. So if you find that, Judges chapter 3, please stand and honor God's word. You can if you're able. And I'm going to start in verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. And therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he sold them into the hand of the Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even of Neil, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against the city of Cushan Rishathim. And the land had rest forty years, and Nathaniel and the son of Kenaz died. Y'all may be seated. Now, point of this, when I was reading through here, I had a thought about these three Judges, and I'm going to share a little bit. And I, I, it's a teaching message. I pray God will preach me. I want you to walk out, learn something new, and, and feel God's spirit that, that this applies today. But the truth is, after I studied, I was I, I was just joy reading. Sometimes I'm always working on a message. I'm working on an angel. I'm always praying. I, I soul pray. God, bring me a message. And and here I said, you know what? I'm going to start with J Judges chapter one. I just felt led to read. I was reading for pleasure, reading for joy. Not, I said to myself, I'm not going to work on a message. I'm not going to be working on an angle. And I got to chapter 3 and read through there. And as I was reading, I had a thought. And I said, God, these aren't very impressive people for judges. And, you know, there's nothing about them that I would have chosen. And I got thinking... Moses and Joshua were servants, but there's a pattern that these judges were never servants, they were deliverers. And that's what Jesus is, he's a deliverer. You know, he came in the, in the guise in the, in the form of a servant, but he was a deliverer, he was a savior, he's a conqueror. And so here, there's parallels all through here with these men. And we've got uh, Othniel, now keep in mind, in this scripture, the Lord is mentioned 13 times. I've circled in my Bible. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. 13 times in 25 verses. Basically, that's on average, every other verse is talking about the Lord. See, in this scripture, the 25 verses, it's not the stories of human heroes that's important. The story is always about the Lord. That's what's important. What Shamgar, by the time we get to him, the third judge in Israel, the whole thing about Shamgar is wrote up in one verse. I mean, one verse is all he gets in the Word of God. One verse. The whole judge. I mean, Samson, you got to read four chapters, five chapters. Everybody gets a lot, but this man got one verse. And, and why? What was so phenomenal about these three men, and especially Othniel? Now, keep in mind, he was Caleb's younger brother. That's true, but there's some discrepancy there because the mom was a situation, and, and there was a little thing going on, and so he was actually the son of, of Caleb, but... 
but yet he was not the son of Caleb, so because his dad was another guy. So there's a, a history there that's not great, you know, because he ended up marrying Caleb's daughter, which wasn't his sister. So there was a little <coughs> frolicking going on there amongst the families. So this was not the ideal guy that you would pick. Also, the guy's in his plus 50s because he reigned for 40 years. He died at 95, and so he's 55 years old to be a leader. Now look, I'm 45 years old, and I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm 45. I don't even want to know what I'm going to feel like when I'm 55. I'm sure I'll be thinner and handsomer and everything. <laughs> now, if I feel like this at 45, I thought to myself, yesterday, yesterday was a long day. It was from 8 to, you know, 4 o'clock. And, and, you know, it was a long day. And I, we appreciate all those that came and helped. And, and, and it was just a good thing. And, and I feel good. But I got blue things popping up on my ankles. I don't know what all that's about. They're kind of swollen. And now just being on my feet. I didn't carry anything but a little cardboard table. I got no reason to be exhausted. And I'm 45 feeling that way. Now here he is, 55 years old. Hey, I'm glad he's gotten married. I'm glad God called him to do something that was phenomenal. What's that? To deliver Israel. To actually be the general in charge, handle business. And those generals in Israel, they didn't rule from the back. They ran from the front. He was ready right in there, and God did the impossible. I guarantee you there was some 28-year-old when Nathaniel stole up on the scene and, and said, hey, I'm going to deliver God, and God's hand is with me, and people, we're going to turn away from the gods of Baal and Ashron, which was Baal's girlfriend's goddess of war. We're going to turn away from that, and we're going to do God's business. Church, we're going to do God's business. Israel, we're going to do God's business. We're going to turn away from wickedness. We're going to turn away from sin. We're going to get our eyes on the cross, our eyes on the Lord, our eyes on the Savior, and wait for Him to redeem His people. And if you will follow me, God will give us victory. That's His message. Some 28-year-old said, Woo! Some 28-year-old warrior said, Man, I'm going to follow this guy. Now, there may have been one in the heart that said, Well, I can do that. I could go down there and whoop that guy. He's 55 years old. Who do you think he is going to come down here and, and free us? God uses weak things to confound yes. the wise. Amen. Over here, you know, the Bible says he sold him. Sold him. Okay? This is interesting that he sold him. I, I made a mental note right here. Yeah, they, got, they sold him. Uh, they were sold. God, they were acting like say, slaves. So God basically was selling them like slaves. Did you know you can become a slave to sin? Yeah. You can put yourself in bondage. When you resist God's will and you do it your way, you're opening up a door for you to be in captivity. And God's doing the same thing today as he did that then. He's an unchanging God. He's a God that's merciful. But you can self-will. It's pitiful when you're trained in a certain way and it won't change. Here's an example. My father-in-law shared a story with me yesterday because he's building a wall. And we had a dog that likes to be with the family. He got separated between the family and the new wall that he built. And he waited patiently for Ronnie to get out of the way where he was trying to set in this door. And, and he wanted to get by in the worst way. And he was whining. And my father-in-law, who was looking at the dog through the two-by-four walls that are 24 inches on center, and the dog stayed on that side. He said, come here, come here. And he didn't go. He was in bondage, self-willed bondage. He didn't realize he could just walk between two two-by-fours. He had been trained so long to walk through the door, he was stand on that. He, he wasn't going to change. He's like, there's a doorway here, and when this stranger moves, Ronnie finally had to move and let it go through. And he was just as happy. <laughs> You're like, he you could have walked through the thing. I could just see my father. I wasn't there, but I could see him talking to the dog. He could have just walked through the studs. <laughs> and Ronnie had to move the tool belt and thing and all this stuff to get out of the way so a dog could walk through the door because the wall, he had all these sections, 12 feet he could have walked through. Lord bless you, Ronnie. He waited to go through the door. Bondage. So many of us, we are in bondage. You talk about healing. I believe in healing. You want to get healed? Get your butt up and get healed. Get your son. God will move. God will bless. 
If you believe, I believe, and if the church prays, and it's expected prayer, healing will come. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. What's wrong? I believe. I believe in that. So here we got Ithniel. Oh, what a, what a man. And the Lord delivered. So that's what God does. Now he is a... a you know, definitely being used as an old person. Did you know if you feel like you're an old person, God will still use you just like he did the first judge. This is the first judge of Israel and was considered the best judge of Israel. Do you know after after you went from Ehud uh, and then, then into Shamgar and then Delilah, then, then all the judges, you know Israel's leadership continually got worse? All the way up to the last judge, Samson, who was a nightmare. He was absolutely just shipwrecked his, his whole ministry. So as Israel declined, now keep in mind, they were in bondage to Jericho. I said, what? They were in bondage to Jericho. Jericho, when they first went to Canaan land, was the first land that Joshua, remember they walked? Yeah. They walked around. That was the first place they conquered. They had the power of God with them. When they were with God, they had the power of God. They conquered a city without lifting a sword. They walked around and the walls fell down. Amen. And now they're in bondage. They lost yeah. it. Now they're in bondage to the same people. They were meant to rule and reign and run off. Bless God. Oh, but the Lord delivered Kusha Rishiet, the um, king of Mesopotamia, to his hand, and he, and he prevailed against them. Now we move into Ehud. Now this is a strange thing, and I'm going to offend somebody. I'm going to offend him. It's just, uh, it's, but it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be as biblical as I can. There's a couple places in here, but I'm going to be biblical. And I understand the argument. You'll know what I'm talking about in just a minute, but I'm going to be bold. You, you pray. You pray for your pastor. The Bible says in verse 12, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Elagon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Now, who strengthened Elagon? He's a bad dude. He's a wicked dude. His name means double wicked. I mean, he was a bad dude. Okay? Uh... So this fellow, not, not only Elgon, there's another thing, but I'll get to that in a minute. He strengthened Elgon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. Now the city of palm trees found in Deuteronomy 34, that is Jericho. So he possessed it. And then it says the Lord strengthened Elgon. The Lord strengthened a bad guy to come against Israel and to defeat Israel and to, why? Because I believe God will use any means necessary to get your attention. Okay? God will use any means necessary to get the attention of his children. That's what God does. And in your life, I'm sure God has done the same thing. If you're stick-necked and stubborn and you say, I'm doing it my way, I'll tell you what, there's somebody in college right now and they're working and they're full of arrogance and they actually think they're smart. They go to college, this new professor, make a silly letter and actually walk out and say, I'm more intelligent than somebody else. <laughs> and they have this twisted, arrogant heart and all of a sudden God says, yeah, okay, I'll put you in a job where you're miserable for 30 years. So you wind up with some bitter nurse or doctor or angry person who winds up with a divorce and shipwrecked kids and, and a shipwrecked problem and life and then the person's like well I'm, and then, then instead of repenting on their knees they even get more arrogant more mad more angry more bitter so one day you're like Roscoe lay in the hospital and you can't get service <laughs> Whereas if the nurse person or the educated person or the whoever person simply said, God, I'm dumb as a rock and let me be dumb as a rock all my life. Let me be smart enough to be in your will. Yeah. And all of a sudden you got the dream job with the dream money and the dream house and the dream spouse and the dream children. And it's everything you ever wanted. And then you'll see later in life where you sit there and think, I don't know why God put all this on me. I haven't done a thing. Be that guy. Be that one. Now here we got this wickedness going on. God set it up that way. It didn't surprise them. They possessing the palm trees, city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Elgon and the king of Moab for 18 years. 
But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up and delivered. Now keep in mind, in the Hebrew, that's Deborah. Crying, the Hebrew word there, that was not repenting. They were just crying. Okay? This is amazing that our God showed compassion and mercy and forgiveness and helped them even though they weren't even repentant. They were crying because of hardship and pain and suffering. They weren't crying because of repentance of the reason why they were suffering. Praise God. If you're here today and you say, Lord, yeah, it's easy to say, oh, I wish God would bless my life. But like we got Brother Rich and I love him to death and he's hysterical. I mean, he's really funny if you get to talking to him. I couldn't help but think, you know, if his heart's desire is something at Puerto Rico or Ricoville, seven coconuts, if that's his heart's desire, then I feel sorry for Rich. And Rich, I don't want that to be your heart's desire. I, I want it to be a nice want that you want. Say, Lord, I, you know my heart. You've blessed me with a beautiful family, people that love me and care about me, and I got love, and, and I feel the love for everything, and I love my pastor. There's no way I'm going to leave him. So I'm going to leave him. I understand that. No way God's going to put that desire. But I want his desire. I'm his friend. And if I'm his friend, I'm going to tell him the truth. And the truth is, his desire better be found and pound and ground in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And same as yours. Same as mine. I thought, man, I'm living the dream. I'm living in Myrtle Beach. And I thought to myself, if I was really living the dream, if I was really living the dream. I'd lose 35 pounds in our house surf. <laughs> you can still do it. it. You can still do it. I know it. I thought if I was real, if I'm going to live the dream surfing, I would love to surf. I would love. I mean, man, I don't know why my dad never let me surf when I was little. We didn't know how. We didn't live anywhere. He wouldn't let me do that either. I lived in the, in the snow in the mountains and I've never been ice skating. Ever. You turn your ankle when you're an athlete. Ugh. I've never been snow skiing. I've never been snow skiing in my whole life. And I live in the mountains. I live 45 minutes of scooping slow. People come from Colorado and ski there. And I've never been my whole life because you'll twist your knee, bad tendons and ligaments. Dad, can I go? <laughs> No offense, Pop, we love it, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, the Lord. God is in control. Now listen to this man. You think he's deceitful. He's not deceitful. He's not being deceitful. Now he uses the word, okay, a Hebrew word here that describes uh, a word or thing. Because he says, I got a message from God for you. Church, you better be careful when you go, I got a message from God for you. All right? You know how many times I've said that in my life? I got a message from God for you. Not many. You know, really not many. Because let me tell you something. If that don't pan out, it will work out. Because if God gives you a message to tell somebody, that thing better come to the truth. That's why all the Old Testament prophets, nobody wanted to be a prophet. That's why they wanted to lay out the fleece and say, let the ground be dry and it be wet. And then it, sure enough it was. And they said, well, let it be dry and the ground be wet. And it sure enough was. That's why they were seeking for signs. Right. Jews are allowed to seek for signs. Gentiles are not. We are people of faith. Amen. We're not to be looking for signs. And if you're going to declare yourself a prophet, if one little teensy weensy prophecy don't come to pass, then you are stoned. And not only were you stoned, your child, if you had one, was stoned. It was a big deal. So when the Lord said, Samuel, you know, you, you, you better, you know, he, he, he wasn't saying nothing until he was told, say, what is it, Lord? Let me tell you, when God knocks on your heart the door, we got to say, Lord, what what we have? What do you need? What can I do? Amen. Oh, listen to what takes place. We're going to, I'm, I'm loving this, okay? I'm loving this. We're going, to, we're going to see a little James Bond going on. Can I say James Bond in the church message? Amen. There's going to be a little espionage taking place. It's like a movie. It reads like a movie. I can just see it right now. So here it says, Oh, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, not repented, but they were crying, the Lord raised them up to deliver Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a man left-handed. Now, this is going to offend a left-hander like Anna. Like Christian. 
there's left-handers in here. But in the Hebrews, when you were considered a uh, left hand, this was not a compliment. I wrote down a note. That way you can't get mad at me because it is in a note. It is described as restricted in his right hand. In other words, it was considered unnatural. It was considered peculiar. Left-handed warriors, left-handed people. Uh, even, you know, the Bible talks about they could sling with the left hand. You know, the, the sons of David that were fighting the fight. And there was reasons for being able to use your left hand. But in, in that culture, left-handedness was considered weird, awkward, not somebody you would follow. Now, God turned something that was unfortunate, just like he used something old and delivered Israel. Now he's using something that as far as that time frame was concerned, left-handers were worthless and made fun of. So God now chooses somebody that in the eyes of everybody, you wouldn't choose a left-handed person. I made my son right-handed. There was a time, this is my note, there was a time that being left-handed was even seen by some as a sign of e uh, evil. Language seems to bear this out in meaning. A man who is awkward had called it gush. A gush is a French word meaning left-handed. Something that is wicked or evil we call sinister. That's a Latin word for the left hand. thought that was interesting. I verified this two sources on Google, so... <laughs> so it was interesting. Left-handed was considered bad. Now, I feel like I made a mistake with my own son because I wanted him right-handed. I wanted him right-handed because I throw the discus. I wanted him right-handed because I throw the shot. I wanted him right-handed because I've always wanted to be a boxer and had bad eyes and, and, and it's a mural, but I always wanted to, he was taken after me. My right eye is worse than my left. I wanted the right eye further back because the left eye could take more punches without affecting eyesight. So I had various reasons why I wanted him. It's also easier to cover and dip, if you know what I'm talking about, because when I'm dipping, I'm away from his power hand. If you're a lefty, you dip into a power hand. You know, guy's right. So I mean, there's, there's, there's you know, being a stopper. So there's a lot of reasons. Now, I think I messed up because he was naturally doing things with his left all the time. Was that, and, I, and I told Jamie, didn't I, woman? I said, put his forks, put his drinks on the right side because he kept using his left. I said, put everything to the right side. Make him force him to use his left. I said, even if he's left-handed, he'll grow up and be left-handed, but then he'll really know, use his right, which will make him better at basketball. He'll be able to dribble both hands easier. <laughs> now, this is why I know I messed up. I'm right-handed. I jump higher on my left foot. Okay, most people, if you're right-handed, you can jump off your left. Shoot a free throw, dunk him. Well, my son jumps better off his right. I couldn't dunk a basketball that way. I couldn't jump off my right. It, it's opposite. Well, I didn't even realize that too. It was in high school, and I ruined his basketball deal because it was uncomfortable for him to jump off the left to dunk. And he could go off the right. So I knew right then I let him down. I tried to make him something that he shouldn't have been. He's a right-hander, but he still does <laughs> things with his left hand. And I wish, he would, I wish I could go back. It's too late. I meant well, Curtis, but I ruined that. He should have been a left-handed. I had a school teacher that was left-handed, and they said, well, they've now proven if you're a left-handed, use the right part of your mind. And if you're right-handed, use the left part of your mind. Dominance. So she says, really, if you're left-handed, you're in your right mind. <laughs> and I get that. I, I get that. But this being lefted, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, oh, he said, uh, the Lord raised him up a deliverer, an Ehud, and a son of Gera, the Benjamite, a man left-handed. And by him, the children of Israel sent a present unto Elgon, the king of Moab. And, and I'm going to read for the sake of time. This says, and Ehud made him a dagger, which had two edges of cubit length, basically from elbow to fingertip. And the Bible says, and he girded under his raiment upon his right thigh. Now that's strange because all soldiers in those days, if you're right-handed, you put it on the left. But he was left-handed, he put it on his right. Boy, God will take the little insignificant things. No doubt. Now keep in mind, there's something about this Ehud because the guards always frisked people before they went to the king. Okay, I'm getting out of the way. So there's James, 
bond, secret, sneaky stuff going on here. And so they would have frisked them, but they just assumed that either one, and I could, I'm not preaching it wrong, they either assumed, they felt his thigh, where everybody puts their swords, nobody puts it on the right side, you draw from the left. They would have frisked his left thigh, assuming he was right-handed, or he was so uh, unimpressive or unthreatening that they didn't even bother checking him. Amen. I mean, he'd have walked in there looking like Bill, bald-headed, beautiful, and mean-looking, They'd have frisked him. But if he'd have went in there like Gomer Powell, they probably wouldn't have. <laughs> so you probably don't know who Gomer Powell is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he made a dagger, had two edges of cubit length, that he did gird under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Elgon, which was a tribute, king of Moab. And Elgon, now listen, to this. this is not politically or socially correct. They're going to antiquate this Bible and say, oh, you can't have a Bible like that no more. Because, hey, this, if you want to be biblical, an Elgon was very fat man. <laughs> What's wrong calling somebody fat? Word of God does. This guy can't be that bad. Now, now you could say, well, Philosophizer, if I'm writing a book and I'm trying to be all smart, I would philosophize and say, well, you know, he's not necessarily fat, but that means he's probably lazy. Maybe he's a hoarder. Maybe he covets. Maybe the tribute was food. So when he came in, Elgon said, I got some special food for you. And he was a very fat man. He liked to get all he can get. Fat meaning, I want more. But you know what it really means in the Hebrew? <laughs> that he's fat. <laughs> he was probably uh, exactly the Bible we could say the other interpretations and if you want to believe that brother God bless you I'm not going to argue with you but whether or not he wanted everything being fat or whether or not he was just simply fat I'm not going to argue the semantics of that but what I can say bless God is that he was a fat man <laughs> So he was a fat man, and he had made an end of the offer of the present. He sent away the people that bear the present. So you can see it. He, he comes in. He says, I got a special thing for you, tribute. And he sends the people that brought it in. I guarantee they flooded it up with 12 or 13 people, and, they, and then he sent them all out. So maybe the bodyguards thought he was safe. Okay? And then it says, but he himself turned again from the queries that were by Gilgal. You recognize that name? Oh man, God's judgment happens at Gilgal. God's judgment. Oh man, I know a man named Jesus that had a date at that very same place, you know, a long time after. Oh, but God is doing judgment. That's what God does. He does judgment at Gilgal. He says, Oh, there by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And then the king said, Keep silence. So, in other words, he sent away the people that brought the tribute. And then he sent him away. He said, I got something very special for you, king. And the king, so arrogant. Man, he, he was living life like he didn't have to care about tomorrow. I mean, he didn't have a thing on his mind. And, he, and then he yells at the guy who's giving him tribute to flex his authority over him. Say, keep silent. And you know what he, he who did? He said, okay. Oh, man, when God says, I know a book that says, be still and know that I'm the Lord. Oh, I'm so glad we can be still. Keep silent. Wait upon God. He told him, said, keep silent. I, you know what I believe he did? I think he kept silent. I think he did, but he was instructed by the wicked king. It says, and all that stood by him went out from him. And he could, came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And he had said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. Now the Hebrew, I have a message, that's the word, means Word or thing. So he said, I have a word or thing to give you. Oh, he was going to give him something, all right. He gave it to him and left it with him. Or should I say, within him. <laughs> and then it said, and he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade. And the fat enclosed upon the blade so that he could not draw out the dagger of his belly and the dirt came out. Now this is getting descriptive. 
Um, in other words, the sword had some kind of hold on the end of it to keep your hands from sliding up and cutting yourself on the blades. And he hit him so hard, he punched him with such a mighty thrust. Bow! That it went inside where the cut was. I mean, he laid it. Laid it to him. And no doubt experienced soldier, as that, that 18 inch blade went in, he pierced it up. And when it came out, it's back about four inches up higher than where the thrust was to hit whatever it was that killed him. He laid him out. Yeah. Laid him out hard. Now, this is some James Bond stuff right here. And I don't want us to miss this point. And, I, and ladies, I apologize because this is bathroom humor. And you want to be professional. I want to be very professional. I'm sure I've got my tie on. <laughs> I'm very professional, but I'm going to be biblical as I can. Oh, and the half went in, the dirt came out, and Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked him. So now he, he killed the king, killed the enemy, he killed the one that promised they were going to slay Israel, and now he leaves the chambers and he shuts and locks the doors. And when he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. They said, surely he covers his feet in his summer chamber. All right, that's bathroom humor. Covering his feet is the term they use to go to the restroom to do a number two. So if you want to be biblical, the next time you've got to do, go to the restroom, you can sit standing up and saying, make an announcement. Uh, wife, children, I need to go to the restroom. If you want to be biblical, you can say, wife, children, I need to cover my feet. <laughs> Think about it, you'll get it later. <laughs> oh, so he's dead. His bowels fill out. The servants are outside the door. They should have killed him. It's a death sentence to let the king die on your watch. But what does he do? He goes out and he shuts the door. And as he's leaving, the servants are kind of curious about the whole thing. They walk up to the door and go, ooh. And they stay outside the door. They think he's going to the bathroom. They say he's covering his feet. I can see two soldiers making jokes at first. Good Lord. <laughs> now while that's going on, Ehud is escaping. He's leaving. And like James Bond, that's why he, he's out of town. He done pulled the crime of the century right into a kingdom, killed the guy, shut and locked the doors. He's leaving. Soldiers walk up to the door and go, whoo. Yeah, I don't need to describe what dirt is. The dirt came out. Now, there's a point to this. Everything in the Bible, it's, it's in there for a reason. Oh, the Bible says they tarried there until they were ashamed. Hebrew word, anxious. Now, I know that things change in time, but I believe a man when he goes to the throne room, likes privacy on the throne room. Maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. I don't know how much, you know, did they have magazines back in those days? You know, did they take entertainment in the throne room? I mean, basically left one throne to go to another. And it cost him his life. These soldiers waited outside long enough that they thought, you know, this is strange. You know, he ought to be done by now. He ought to be done. So they went in, and the Bible says, He opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore they took a key, and they opened it. And behold, their Lord was fallen down, dead on the earth. And he had escaped while they tarried, and passed beyond the quarries, and escaped unto Syria. And it came to pass, as he come, that one blew the trumpet. Now listen what God will do when he takes a calamity. David killed Goliath, and they shouted, and the army ran. Why? Because the, the giant fell. That's what happens. When we will stand, when you will stand and face God's enemy, God will give you victory. He'll let you overcome. And what will happen? The church will follow. The church will shout. The nation will follow. If a group of leaders will get together and pray on their knees, God restore us, then the earth and the nation will follow. Amen. It will happen in the time of the Israelites. It happened in the time of the Hebrews. And it can happen in the time of the United States. If we'll just get on our knees. Amen. Oh, it came to pass that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount. And he before them. And he said unto them, follow after me. 
for the Lord. So he said, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, in your hand. Then they went down after him. Now I'm going to read for the sake of time and story. <coughs> and they stood on Moab at the time, about 10,000 men, all lusty and men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the, hand had, and the land had rest four score years, which was 80 years. Amen. He was obedient and had peace for 80 years. Church, I want to encourage you. This is an encouraging message. What can we get out of this message? Not only God used somebody old, but God used somebody that was particular Amen. or peculiar Amen. or that was not favorable, Amen. that was considered lesser of other people. Just considered out of the way. Boy, God can use you. Amen. I'm glad that I can be considered lesser. If I look at myself by worldly standards compared to most men, I mean, I'm falling short. We're all falling short. And we'll close with this last judge with this one verse. This guy, interesting about this guy is I researched and, and studied through <coughs> Shamgar. That's not even an Israelite name. And that's what caught me, you know, not an Israelite. Not only that, but the, what Bible says, and after him was Shamgar. So it's not an Israelite name. He's a foreigner. The son of Anath. You know what Anath is? That is the goddess of war. A Canaanite goddess of war. He's named after a Canaanite goddess of war. That is a no-no if you're an Israelite. You're not going to pick. Who is this stranger that's moved into town and living amongst the Hebrews? I guarantee he was ostracized and not fit in. But he was a man's man. He was a, a manly man. He was God's man. And he was one bad dude. Now an ox goat, I didn't even know what an ox goat was. I wish I could act all smart and tell you, but I had to look it up. An ox goat is simply an eight-foot stick with a, uh, a point on the end of it, usually an iron point, that they used to guide ox through the pasture. So they would train ox with them, they were driving ox when they were plowing, and they would use this eight-foot stick on them. And with that being said, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Adath, which slew the Philistines, 600 men, with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. Now keep in mind, the Bible didn't say that he killed 600 men in one day, you know, which I think he could have done if that's what God wanted him to do. Or, or it could have just been, you could say the interpretation that he slew with the Philistine 600 men with an ox goat. Maybe you could say he did that in one day. Or throughout his career, he killed 600 men. Either way would work for me. Either way would apply. All I know is he did kill 600 men. I don't think it's a figurative number. I don't think it's a speculative number. I don't think it's just a roundabout number. I think the brother killed, and if he killed one less, then he would say he killed 599 men. Amen. So I don't like the, but nevertheless, what, what, so this guy is truly, I thought to myself, unlikely. Shamgar was unlikely. He was a foreigner. He wasn't accepted. He was an outsider. God uses the old. God uses the weird. God uses the outsiders to do what? To deliver. In church, if you're ahead of your house, God will use you. Whether you're fat, bald, slow, smart, dumb, uneducated, educated, doesn't matter. God wants to use you. He wants to use you. If you're here today and you say, you know what? I have imperfections. God wants to use you. If he chose these three, did you know if you lined up the room right here and I'm going to pick somebody to fight for me, I'm going to pick who I think is impressive. Lynn, I'm not going to pick you. I'd have picked you 40 years ago, maybe. But I'm not going to pick him because, you know, the man's in his 90s. You know, he's, uh... Well, you look like you're in your 90s. <laughs> I'm not going to pick Lynn. I'm not going to pick me. I look like I swing three times. I'm going to stroke out of here. I'm going to pick what looks good to the eye. That's just what I'm going to, I won't pick the thing, God that I think has endurance. I shared it with that, that walk of the thing where they, some student one time asked me, he said, would you fight, would you stay and fight if everybody went to zombies, what would you do? And I was like, man, I'd grab baseball back and go to town. He said, I wouldn't run, I'm going to run no way. I'm going to stand right here and I'll fight. And they're like, no, man, you'd be running, you'd be running scared, you get out. I'm like, man, ain't no way I'd run. I, I run 50 feet, the zombies wouldn't have to kill me. I'm hard to. 
and I can't run 100 feet. I can't run 100 feet. I'd have to grab a baseball bat. When they say, don't make me a leader, Rich, because I grab a baseball bat and I'll make everybody stay with me and we'll fight. Because I know I can't run. You know, I can't run. I just can't do it. I'm not going to do it. These three men, God used in a powerful way, he delivered them. They, they, you know, he was an elder. He was peculiar. He was unlikely. These guys, all, all by right, had flaws. And had flaws. Amen. But God will use you in the Amen. most powerful way. Amen. If y'all would, please stand. Amen. Now that's the three judges in Israel. You know what Elgon, you know what that name means in Hebrew? It's ironic. His name means fat ox. How ironic is that? Boy, God knew what that guy was going to become when they named him. I don't know what in the world. You know, he was an ox that was brought to the slaughter. Boy, when God smites your enemies, and there's enemies here that God will bring to the slaughter. You want, I like where John, they did that lung cancer thing, and they said, I, I asked Linda, and I, and I talked to her, and I said, well, what, how did the cancer go that was on his liver? And she said, the doctor said, they obliterated it. Oh, man, it's like that cancer was brought to the slaughter. Well, that's what God does with the enemies. He brings them to the slaughter. If you got enemies, you just take them before the Lord with a good heart. Let God obliterate your enemies. He'll do it. The enemy of sin, the enemy of sorrow, enemy of death, God will obliterate. Lynn looks old. He's one of my favorites. I, I know. I'm 84 years old. I love Lear. And me and Lynn are friends. But you know, God ain't done with you. I got a little nervous because I talked to Pastor. Well, he's just sitting around that recliner. I don't want him. I try to encourage him. I'm like, well, real man always gets where he can put on his own boots. And I said that. He wears boots. I said, you can't get so tight, you can't put on your own boots. I don't see it. That'd break my heart. I go to fasting. The lid ain't going to get after it. I go fasting mode. It'd be your fault that I'm losing weight. <laughs> losing sleep. Because I do that for me. God put that on my heart. God is not done with you. When Jeremiah said, I'm going to close with this. I don't want to be long with it. Jeremiah said, how long shall I preach? God had called him. He said, how long? And God said to him, to the earth be desolate. What? Did you know the earth never got desolate during his time? But what an answer. God, how long do I preach till the earth be desolate? Another way, another words in the English language, you preach until you die. Amen. Amen. Church, if you're breathing the breath of life, you are a living soul. You work and stay in God's will until you die. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning.